Hello friends and welcome to the channel. This video is about INICT. I know, uh, you know, most of the medical students, most of the MBBS students throughout India, throughout all the GMCs and other colleges, they dream of doing their MD or MS at AIMS, right? It's everyone's dream, but only a few are able to make it possible. Now in this video, I want you to understand the pattern. I want you to understand what INICT requires from you. Because we know from the results that most of the students who are selected have not done their MBBS from AIMS. They are from GMCs, they are from Peripheral Medical College, right? So it is possible for each and every one of you to understand the pattern of the exam, do good in the exam and do your dream, you know, um, branch in a dream institute like AIMS Delhi, okay? So what I'll try to do through this video is make you understand the pattern of INICT, which has actually not changed from a long time so that you're able to make your own strategy and you know prepare yourself for this exam now i will revolve over three fundamental aspects which i believe are are important for cracking this exam number 1 the previous questions trust me the number one resource that you have the most important resource that you have are the previous 5 to 10 year questions right Second, I want you to understand that second prof subjects are important and some clinical skills, some clinical knowledge, that, that acumen is important for answering questions on INICT, okay? And third, because this is a tough exam, because you need to be in top top 20 or top 30 ranks, all India ranks, to be able to get something like medicine, something like surgery, something like pediatrics or such branches at AIMS Delhi. So because competition is tough, because you need to be in top 20 or top 30 ranks. You need to do lots of revisions. The more the number of revisions, the easier it will be for you to, 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 to have a good rank. Why? Because the more the number of revisions you have, the lesser are the chances that you will make some easy mistake, some easy question getting wrong, because that is what matters in this exam. So the first thing is first, know the pattern of the exam see the name of this exam might have changed it might have changed from i mean i appeared in aims pg it was called aims pg back in 2017 it's now called inict but trust me the subjects are the same the examiners are the same same professors are setting the paper and in fact the questions seem to be the same you know i was just checking a few of the questions from inict this november 2022 exam and interestingly, they seem like the same questions which used to be there in 2014, 15, 16, the same old questions of AIMS PG entrance, right? So for example, this picture, you had to identify which bone marrow needle it is. This picture from a standard book, you had to understand that this is a Gaucher cell. This picture from a thyroid cancer or these common questions on tumor markers. You know, what are the tumor markers in Hodgkin's lymphoma? I mean, these questions have appeared in AIMS in the past for so many years and they're likely to appear again. What does that mean? It means that AIMS PG or INICD, what is called nowadays, this exam does have some favorite areas. This exam does have hot spots, the high yield things, the questions that are repeated quite often that you can understand fully and in detail so that you don't get any of these questions wrong. Questions that are repeats, not direct repeats, but repeats from relevant topics, you cannot afford to get those questions wrong because you need to be in the top 20 or top 30 ranks. Another thing I want you to point about in this exam is that some questions are really easy. For example, CFTR gene mutation in cystic fibrosis. We know Delta 508, you know, you've read it from second year MBBS. That's what's being asked here. 508 position, phenylalanine, that's what Delta F stands for. It's easy question. Iron overload state, what is the marker? Serum ferritin. Neurogenic shock, hypotension, bradycardia. These are easy questions. They're like ABC of MBBS. Tet tetralogy of fallow, this boot-shaped heart. Cyanotic spells, ejection systolic murmur, left second intercostal space. These are simple questions. Your exam will have simple questions and your goal is not to get even one such question wrong. You will mark each and every one of these simple questions correct. That is how you reach to that top rank, okay? Now, the second part. You need to have some clinical logic because AIMS will ask questions which are not one step, you know, which, which are not like one-liners. They need some multi-step thinking or reasoning, okay? For example, let's understand 
epic now these questions these screenshots taken from other videos on the youtube because i was not there in the exam i had to get to get the questions from some resource for example this question cyanotic heart disease with increased pulmonary blood flow is seen so you need to understand that there are cyanotic heart diseases and then the cyanotic diseases can have decreased pulmonary blood flow tof is a typical example or some of these cyanotic heart disease can have increased blood flow and if you have attended clinical rounds you would I'm sure you would have heard your consultants talk about transposition of great arteries in such a setting. CCHD increased QP physiology transposition as a as an example of that, and it's quite easy to understand that some of these some of these options can be easily ruled out by your clinical thinking. You know, hypoplastic left heart syndrome has to deal with left side of the heart, so there's nothing like decreased pulmonary blood flow. Epstein's anomaly has to deal with tricuspid valve, a tricuspid regurgitation. There's nothing to deal with CCHD decreased QP. It had to be TOF or it had to be TGA. And TOF is decreased QP physiology, decreased pulmonary blood flow physiology. So what is left is TGA. So some of these questions by clinical reasoning can be solved. The next question, like 30 year, now the, I'm not presenting these questions so that you know the, uh, I mean, I, I want to tell you the answers of these questions. No, I want to tell you the pattern of this exam. Okay, so if you see, for example, 30-year-old 30-year-old patient has back pain and pain in the legs on walking, you think of claudication. But, okay, but what you see is that it improves in walking uphill as compared to downhill. Such history is not a part of intermittent claudication. That's not a part of disease called peripheral arterial disease. This has something to do with lumbar canal stenosis. Now, it's easy to understand. You can rule out TB, hip, and Berger's disease, but you would have a confusion between lumbar canal stenosis and atherosclerosis. So it's easy to figure out that why would a patient of peripheral arterial disease have an improvement in the pain in the leg or back while walking upstairs or while walking uphill? It's not possible. Okay, so which leaves you with this question, lumbar canal stenosis. And again, if you would have attended clinical rounds in your final year MBBS or in your third year, whenever, if you would have attended clinical rounds, I'm sure your consultant would have at, at some time picked up this question. How do you differentiate neurogenic claudication from claudication of peripheral arterial disease? It's an important clinical question. Everyone would have taught you during your MBBS rounds. Okay. Now, for example, the question here on the right, this person describes what is called hemineglect, right? The patient does, he shaves only the right side of the body. He does not bath the right, left side of the bar, body. And when he was asked to draw the clock, and this is what he draws. Okay, so where's the lesion? You need to know that this is hemi neglect and it's due to involvement of a non dominant parietal lobe. So it involves clinical decision making, it involves your clinical logic. So such questions may be difficult to solve, but this is AIMS exam. So you need to prepare yourself clinically. You need to attend your rounds. You need to see patients. See, I know you can rote memorize these lesions. You can rote memorize that lesion at which place in the brain or spinal cord produces what neuro deficit. But it's better that you see patients in your ward and that way you'll remember for a long time. Okay? And now, some questions like this. What sign is being elicited? You know, this was asked so many times. You know, they will, they will show a picture of an ankle reflex being elicited. They will show a picture of Babinski sign being elicited. Such things are simple if you attend clinical postings. It's quite easy to tell which of these is CCHD increased QP. It is quite easy to tell is this claudication due to neurogenic cause or due to peripheral arterial disease. It's quite easy to tell that this is hemi neglect and it is due to involvement of non-dominant parietal lobe. And it's quite easy to tell it's Babinski sign if you have attended your clinical postings. It's not about rote memorization. It is not about learning from any coaching app or any online platform. It is easy. It's easy stuff if you attend your clinical postings in your MBBS, right? So what I want to point out is that this exam will ask you questions about diseases that are common in your wards. I've, I've, I've repeatedly told you about this in the previous videos as well, that go in your wards, see what patients are admitted, look at their diagnosis, read those topics from standard books in your MBBS. You know, that way you will nail this exam, okay? And then the emergencies. As an MBBS student, as an intern, you're supposed to know each and every emergency in general medicine and general surgery. Know the basics of management. This is a patient with acute severe asthma. You need to know the treatment. You need to, and now, look, they might change the pattern. They might change it into like these extended forms, A and B and C, multiple options are correct, but that's a different deal. Change the pattern of the exam, do whatever you want to do, but this concept doesn't change. How you manage a patient of severe acute asthma. 
that you need to do nebulization with a bronchodilator. You need to give oral steroids. You need to go oxygen as the step number one. Okay, and it's not. It's he doesn't need an urgent X-ray. Okay, for example, patients with stroke. I mean, if you have, if you have attended your clinical posting in your emergency in general medicine, you would have seen hundreds of cases of MI, hundreds of cases of stroke, and you would have thrombolized so many patients. And each and every time you would have checked your book for contraindications of thrombolysis. And that way, this question is, is easy. This is peanuts. This question is so easy then, that which is a contraindication to thrombolysis? So you know that somebody who has uncontrolled hypertension despite medical therapy is a contraindication to thrombolysis because there's risk of intracranial bleed in such a patient. Simple clinical stuff from emergencies and that you're supposed to know. And it's easy. It doesn't need any coaching. It doesn't need any online platform, okay? And then one more set of questions that you'll find in the exam are this. They require you to pay attention. Pay attention to the details of the questions. For example, a lady who has ARDS on a ventilator, and this is a blood gas. You need to interpret the blood gas and then decide what change in the ventilator settings you want to make. This lady has a, has a partial pressure of oxygen, just 50. Her CO2 is okay. Her FI, she's already on a high FI2. Her PEEP is 5. This is her inspiratory-expiratory ratio. Now, which ventilator settings do you want to change? Why would you decrease the FiO2? if she already has low PaO2 levels. Okay, why would you change the IE ratio from one is to three to one, to one, from one is to two to one is to three? This is not a case of obstructive lung disease, okay? So what is left is increased PEEP. So attention to details of things like blood gas and ventilator settings. Or for example, this question, patient having hemibilismus, which area of the brain is involved? They want you to pay attention to the detail. Somebody has hemineglect, which area is involved? Somebody has hemibilismus, subthalamic nucleus, which area is involved? So they want you to pay attention to detail. This is easy stuff to understand. Know the pattern of the exam, work for that pattern. Okay, now another key thing of this exam is the overlap. Now, this question, many of you may not be able to tell me that if this is from pharmacology, if this is from microbiology, if this is from general medicine. This is a patient with history that suggests of cerebral malaria. And there's a picture around it. You know, this you can easily remember from your microbiology. This, these, are, these are the parasites of plasmodium in the red blood cells. And likely this is falciparum malaria because you see multiple of these um, parasites in the red blood cells. So you know the treatment for cerebral malaria is artesunate. So it required pharmacology, it required microbiology to, to identify this, and it required clinical sense to understand this patient has fever and drowsiness and coma, has cerebral malaria. So what is what I mean is that your second prof subjects actually form the basis of all the clinical questions they ask. You know, you don't need to you don't even need to read general medicine in detail. You will be able to solve these questions by information from pathology, microbiology, pharmacology. For example, one more question. This is a question on Hodgkin's lymphoma. They repeatedly ask such questions, asking of biomarkers from different tumors. Now, you're not sure. I'm not sure this question could have been asked by somebody from pediatric oncology. It may not have been asked from somebody from pathology. So these questions, which are posed by clinicians in the exam, a faculty from pediatric oncology might have put this question, but this question can be easily solved by information from pathology. Okay? Now, there's one more important thing. You know, it was in fact pointed out in a previous question as well, this patient who had ischemic stroke required thrombolysis, and which was a contraindication. Now, another question on the same lines, an old person coming to the ER with headache. Now, which of the following scenarios requires further investigation? You know, and you don't want to discharge the patient, send him home on some medication. Rather, you want to work up this patient to rule out some serious underlying disorder. And here's a table from Harrison. Clearly, this question was taken from this table. What I mean is that image from standard subjects, image from standard books, look at these images. Most of these images will be from Robbins. And most of the questions that are something like this, you know, something which is a clinically important question, something like this, a patient with headache, what all things are worrisome, what all things point to a serious underlying disorder so that you don't discharge this patient home, sudden onset headache, first severe headache, worst headache ever. This is what the question asked. So what I mean is that you need to read images and important tables from standard books, okay? Then, so finally, 
what I tried to do through this video was to brief you about the pattern of this exam. The names have changed. AIMS PG has become INICT. But subjects, the content of those subjects, the examiners have not changed. You can revise from previous 5 to 10 year question papers. You can know the hot areas. You can know the important topics. You know, I felt at my time that I, this AIMS exam was easier than NEET. My rank in NEET was, I don't remember, 300 or 400. But my, my rank in AIMS was 16. Why? Because I understood the pattern of the exam. I did prepare systematically. This is what I want you to do, a systematic preparation. Look at the previous 10 year questions that AIMS has asked. Read those topics by heart. It doesn't matter where you read them from. Your own notes, some coaching, prep ladder, marrow, whatever it is, you need to know these topics. See, it doesn't take prep ladder to tell you that this bone marrow needle is what type of bone marrow needle, or this cell is a Gaucher cell, or this is a patient with hemineglic. It doesn't need prep ladder, it doesn't need marrow. It needs any resource, whatever you like. Okay. And in fact, it will be present in every book. You take a standard book, it will definitely be there. You take prep ladder, they would have explained this question in their subject. You take marrow, you take any, you take any coaching note. You even take photocopy of, of whatever handwritten notes you have. Everyone would have touched this point. Stroke deficits. This is the deficit. Where is the lesion? The treatment of cerebral malaria, artisan. This is everywhere. You just need to be systematic. You just need to know what you need to read. Okay, you just need to know those topics and read those thoroughly and revise them. The second thing that I want you to understand is you need to have strong basics to be there in the top 30 or top 50 rank. Why? Because if you don't have strong basics, you won't be able to correlate things. You won't be able to think in, times of in, in lines of integrating pharmacology and microbiology and answering a question from general medicine. And third thing, revisions. I repeat, you cannot afford to get an easy question wrong. This question does have questions like maybe 20 odd questions which are very difficult, which are difficult for even a top ranker, which are difficult even for a faculty of that subject. Okay, there, there, there are some controversial questions as well, but they don't decide the rank. The rank is decided by questions that are moderate in difficulty or easy in difficulty level. You don't want to get those questions right. You don't want to get those questions wrong. I'm sorry. So the way to minimize your mistakes in easy questions is to do rap multiple revisions, four, five, six revisions, the higher, the better. And I want you to know that previous questions are your best guide and any coaching material, any review book, whatever book it is, will work. You need to know the topics. You need to know them in detail. Okay. I wish you luck for future exams, the next INICT, the next NEED PG, and I wish you luck in getting your dream branch and dream institute. Thank you.